Uh, you know, we, we can uh, we come on that. I, I will say that not all Mississippi line wells are the same. Uh, we can ask me a few questions on that since we've got quite a number of those in America at the minute. Um, what I thought I would do, as, as David mentioned, is just run you through what may be seen as curious or a bit of a joke. Um, why are we interested in the Cambridge Place as an unconventional resource? Uh, I am going to be talking about it offshore. Um, so this would then therefore be the first uh, offshore unconventional play. Um, although I think, as you may see, there may be other things out there that have been built in the past, produced in the past, that I probably count as unconventional um, back then, but which were counted as conventional. Um, so I want to run through that, uh, go through why we think there is a core to the Cambridge Clay gap in the North Sea and just some of uh, Maybe just taking a, a step back, um, just going through this whole idea of conventional and, and unconventional. Most people have seen these sorts of slides in the past. I'm sure John probably won't be too happy with my gap in the three, etc. But I think that the key thing for us is we only look at places that have generated conventional oil and gas production in the past. We're not interested in places which have got fantastic source rocks, great TOC. Um, if they haven't actually led to unconventional conventional oil and gas production, we usually stay pretty clear of them. Um, so one of the things that we find more and more interesting is an idea called percolation migration rather than uh, looking at the majority of migration going off major faults. Um, and when you look at enough plays from a statistical point of view, you actually find that you know, 80 to 90 percent of oil, not gas, but of oil, actually uh, is trapped in conventional means right above the mature source rock. Um, so what better place to look um, is around the conventional fields, and that's what we tend to do. Um, so we, we look globally uh, at uh, various uh, uh, various parts of the world. At the minute, it's been a, a sort of North America, uh, European uh, screen. Um, we look uh, at a lot of geochemistry. We've we'll worked with Brian uh, in the past, and, and can't recommend Brian more uh, to anybody who's looking at a, a top quality geochemistry and basic model. Um, and we uh, build mass balance. Um, uh, estimates for all the basins we look at to see if there is enough there to go after. Uh, for example, we don't in the <coughs> basin, for example, we just don't think there's enough there uh, to actually uh, go after uh, despite what, what various people and, and can say. So where are we positioned? Um, we're positioned in a number of what would be classed as Mississippi line with uh, plays uh, both in Illinois um, and Indiana, which is going after the Mississippi line and the, the deeper uh, New Albany shale that's high oil. Uh, Mississippi line in Los Angeles Arch, which is in eastern Colorado, again, tight oil. Um, and uh, there's a number of all Mississippi line plays that we have assessed and looked at, not all of which are uh, successful uh, given the water production, which is the major killer of many uh, tight oil play. Uh, we've got a shale gas position. Wyoming, and we are just about to see our second well in the Wolf Camp in the Permian Basin, the, the Delaware side of the Permian Basin, which is the inside oil. Uh, we're also in the Lower Saxony Basin looking at Posidonia um, in Germany, and again, tight oil. Uh, so, why the, the Cambridge play? Um, I think a, a few finding cooling talks ago, um, uh, there was a uh, a, a presentation looking at the Cambridge play um, on, in and around Dorset, and I'm not going to recap uh, that again. Obviously, our, our name comes from uh, the Cambridge play as it is an amazing source rock. Um, however, if you go down to, to Cambridge uh, Bay in Dorset, you'll find that the Cambridge play is uh, you know, at the very earliest, if you push the boat out stages uh, of maturity, and if you go slightly offshore or into the Isle of Wight, becomes a bit more uh, mature, although most of the oil from that part of the world uh, comes from the deeper bias. Um, however, it's, it's really in the North Sea where the Cambridge clay comes into its own and goes right uh, through into a maturity spectrum that gets it right into the, the gas uh, window and, and, and 
therefore we see quite a lot of oil and associated gas or, or pure gas from the source of the image play uh, in the North Sea. Um, and what we try and do at, at Cambridge is we, we, we try and put out on our website, so go and have a look at uh, uh, CambridgeEnergy.com. Um, we try and put out a lot of our research and our learnings uh, on the web, which you can uh, download for free. Um, and we decided, because a lot of our investors were giving us questions like, why do you call yourselves Cambridge? So we thought, right, we'll put out a, a piece saying, why Cambridge? And in the process of which, um, we started to say, well, wouldn't it be fun if we could find the core area of the Cambridge Bay in the North Sea? Because obviously it has generated oil and gas, uh, and, and therefore it probably has a, a core area in unconventional terms. Um, and that sort of led to one thing and another, and uh, thus this, this presentation today. Um, what is interesting is about the Cambridge Bay in the North Sea, and pretty much, pretty much everybody in the room will have some exposure to the uh, North Sea, um, oil and gas. Um, what you tend to find in the North Sea is you've got a cluster of uh, conventional uh, oil fields in the tertiary, then you've got a clustering from the lower Cretaceous <coughs> right through uh, uh, the Jurassic and into the, the upper Triassic that all seem to be coming uh, from the Cambridge Plain and also you've, you've got some oddities uh, that, that can be uh, deeper, uh, deeper or older uh, conventional targets. But what we tend to find in pretty much everywhere we look is what we term a saturated system where uh, the source rock gets buried uh, usually way into the oil window or probably best for tight oil into the, the oil condensate uh, window. Um, and it basically pushes out all of the formation water in the forest reservoirs uh, around it. Uh, leading to a, a saturated oil system. Now, obviously, a, a huge amount of that oil then goes off and migrates into conventional traps, but a significant amount of what was generated stays in and around uh, the source rock. Um, and it's surprising when you look at the North Sea from a different angle how many stratigraphic traps or potential pseudo unconventional plays there actually are in the North Sea that we've all classed as conventional. Frankly, they're probably more unconventional than conventional. Um, for example, just two settings. Now, the, the, the famous one being, sorry for, for the quality here, but being the total fault blocks uh, in, in the Brent uh, system where you've got um, the Cambridge Clay and underlying the, the, the Jurassic and lower Jurassic Brent formations. And you've got them, uh, basically, the reservoirs being very close uh, to the source rock. A clearer uh, indication of where the Cambridge Clay is pretty much in the, in the same um, position as a conventional reservoir is in the Bravey, where you, you've got interfingering between sandstones and shales, um, and you've got basically mature uh, source rock uh, displacing oil straight into a reservoir that, that it, it touches, um, and obviously getting, getting trapped in a, in a structural setting. So we sort of took this one stage further and said, well, if this is happening, um, the Cambridge Bay has got interesting uh, mineralogy and it's got like, bits of sand in it which never were uh, fully targeted or conventional plays in the past. Could it work off structure? So could it work in basin centers where you've still got the Cambridge Bay uh, generating uh, oil and that oil basically traveling uh, very short distances away from the source rock or actually within the source rock itself? And that's still um, liquid um, hydrocarbons today. So what we did was we started doing the basics, um, pulling together what we could in the North Sea, uh, and also uh, from geochemistry from uh, the Cambridge Clay um, uh, onshore as well, uh, looking at a significant amount of wells, um, and basically trying to determine where the Cambridge Clay was thermally uh, mature um, in the North Sea. It is surprising the lack of decent geochemistry and basic modeling work that's been done in the North Sea. I, I just, time and time again, you come back to this, that the way I was trained up and maybe many in the room, you didn't really care about source rock. As long as something out there may have generated oil and gas, all we cared about was the reservoir. And all we cared about was 
very basic understanding of, uh, of migration pathways. And as long as it had a four-week dip closure, forget all the rest. If there was a source rock anywhere nearby, it probably will have fed oil and gas into that uh, structural setting. Um, and just even trying to understand a good mass balance for the whole of the North Sea is not really out there. Trying to see where uh, the geochemistry, the geochemistry is pretty much killed off by BP when they killed it off themselves um, in the 80s. And then nobody looked at the geochemistry really in the North Sea apart from some uh, academic work until very, very recently. Um, so we believe it's, it's a very misunderstood um, province uh, from a, a source rock point of view. Um, we focused in, uh, in primarily in this, uh, central um, North Sea and the South Bight and Brabham uh, for our analysis because it was in these areas that we saw the best well results um, and also where we could see <coughs> the key components that we liked uh, in terms of the building blocks of what we chased after um, as a tight oil uh, play. Uh, primarily, we started looking around about 2,000 to 5,000 meters depth, um, but we, uh, we cut that down to, to be more focused, as, as you'll see in a moment. Now, we'll talk a bit about the Balkan, I've also added a few other examples on here as well, because I, I think, as the previous speakers have, have talked about, the Balkan is relatively unique, and frankly, there isn't one shale play out there, be it uh, a tight oil play or shale gas play, that's the same as each other. Every single one of them is different, and it's different because of their depth, it's different because of their thickness. Um, the ones that seem to work seem to have a few uh, characteristics that, that are shared, and, and they start off with the, the real basics. They all have to have an original TOC that's reasonably high. And I've done the chemistry play a bit of an injustice here um, because uh, of its thickness. Uh, but when you look at some of these plays, you're, you're talking about over, in, in places, over 10% uh, 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 TOCs. In some cases, uh, the original TOC was way over 25. Um, in the Posidonia, where we've also got a position, uh, commonly today at 2,000 meters, you'll still find TOC and a uh, uh, TOC of seven at uh, 2,000, 2,500 meters when it's uh, well into the oil window. So when you think of what it was originally before it actually started converting uh, into oil and gas, it, it was really significant. That's a major one for us, obviously, is the TOC. The second for tight oil plays, which is critical to us, is the S1 number. So as Brian described earlier, the free oil number. Now, in many cases, you see free oil numbers in the one or two uh, sort of range. We look for something that's a lot, lot higher, uh, up in the five, sixes, and in places you can get to the walking, uh, where, where it's even higher uh, than that. So to us, that, that is a critical number because it's basically showing that you've got real oil sitting in fractures and four spaces. If you get down to uh, another critical factor for us, it is drill depth. Um, a lot of the successful plays seem to be in the sort of 7 uh, to 12, 13,000 feet uh, uh, mark. Um, and why is that important? Well, A, it usually means they've gone actually well into the oil window. They haven't just crept into the oil window, they've got well into it. Uh, I think in many cases you want to see it going into the condensate uh, window just to get that extra generation, that extra pressure uh, behind the reservoir. Um, so the North Sea, uh, in this example, is, is sitting perfectly. In fact, it, it is slightly strange in that the North Sea and in any other place on the planet, you would have expected most of it to have converted into gas if you're just looking at uh, trends that are based on uh, typical uh, conversion factors for this sort of type of uh, source rock versus depth. The other important comment is uh, the mineralogy. Uh, more than quartz content, I would say that the tight oil uh, space is looking at carbonate content. Um, tight oil, uh, uh, sorry, quartz content is something that was in vogue in the shale gas revolution. And everybody in the UK and the UK onshore round is all talking about quartz content. Frankly, the industry's moved on from that. Quartz content is, is, is fine and good because it's brittle. Most of the tight oil plays are carbonates. They're not shales, they're marls, marl stones variations along that theme. 
Um, and when you see uh, the carbonate contents, like in, in parts of the beach, they can get well up into the 80s, and Posidonia, and again, it averages out across the whole of Posidonia at about 45 to uh, 50 percent, but very, uh, very uh, uh, carbonate rich uh, bits, and, and, and less so in the other parts, but it's still uh, pretty high. And the last thing I would say is there does tend to be a trend of having normal to over pressure uh, as being important just to provide that extra lift for oil, which is a uh, difference in that. Um, so what does the Kimmerich clay look like? Again, Stellar's, sorry if you can't read this, this is Kimmerich clay blue Nordag shale, which is the, the source rock for the uh, Canadian, um, uh, Canadian oil sands, and then the eagle fur uh, in orange, so gray, orange, and, and blue. Uh, you can see on the TOC versus S2, S2s um, typically anything above you know, 25 or 30 in the S2 looks pretty good. You're getting you know, ridiculously high numbers um, uh, here uh, in both the Cambridge Clay and the Eagle If you try and look at what an S1 looks like for the Cambridge Clay, the data is brilliant out there. Usually most people went straight through the Cambridge Clay, usually got a big gas kick or something like that. Uh, it was a, nearly a drilling hazard. Um, I mean, we're either targeting a conventional reservoir very close to the Cambridge Clay or something deeper, but didn't really care too much about it. Uh, but if you look at the S1s at peak maturity, you're talking at uh, potentially up in the sort of 6 to 10 uh, range, which is excellent um, as well. Um, you're looking at a burial uh, uh, maturity um, of around uh, 0.75 to 0.85. A lot of what we see in, in the Kimmerich Clay in the North Sea, where it looks really good, it's more up around one. Um, there is a very good correlation uh, in the Kimmerich Clay between uh, the, the gamma rays and the TOCs, um, and you can see the TOCs get up extremely high uh, in parts of the Kimmerich Clay, and that's getting up you know, to 27% at 13,000 feet. You know, just think what the original TOC would have looked like since there, there's been uh, some conversion um, out of this. Um, so we like to see something that, that, that started off with fantastic organic uh, content uh, and is still a reasonably good organic content today. Um, so when you look at, at its S1s versus other uh, significant plays, it's, it's in the range of all uh, the top um, uh, the top plays. Um, across uh, the world uh, to date, uh, with that S1 range in the sort of 5 to uh, 10 expected, you've got a much bigger uh, minimum of max. When you convert that into oil in place per section of sections a square mile, um, that's the, the typical way of measuring this sort of thing in, in the US, um, you've got between 45 to 90 million barrels uh, per section. Um, for thicknesses of 200 to 500 meters. That's a bit of a stretch because a frack's never going to get uh, to 500 meters, but certainly it could, it could get most of the way to 200 meters. And those numbers are uh, pretty uh, pretty impressive. You, you don't really want to be touching much under uh, 20 uh, million barrels per section. Uh, lastly, uh, one of the things we, we, we started to do was to define the core of the Kimmerich place. So it's pretty important to start to put a, a cutoff in terms of depth. Uh, you want to be definitely well within the oil window. Uh, you don't want to be uh, too, to have too much gas. And obviously, in the North Sea, depth is all important, both from a cost point of view of drilling, plus what does your water depth look like. So we had a, 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 an oil window range of between uh, 2,500 to 5,000 meters uh, depth. We had to narrow that somewhat from a, 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 a key uh, factor being uh, you want to keep outside of semi sub territory just from a cost, uh, cost point of view. Um, so, what does that look like in the North Sea? So, if you add together maturity and you add together the sort of richness of the Kimmeridge clay, you, you get sort of unsurprisingly along the main rift axis of the, of the North Sea, running right up the, the Viking Ground, and especially in the Southern Viking Ground, a little bit. Uh, going to the west, but then you're getting into the central North Sea as well. In this entire area, the only place that actually makes sense, in our opinion, uh, to go out to the Cambridge Bay is in Jackal territory, uh, if you ever wanted to make play out of this. So, so you're basically talking about uh, the shallower side of the, of the central ground. Uh, so 
the, the last component is you want to start to think about the thickness um, of any particular plate that, that is thick enough that you're not going to fracture into or stimulate into um, any rocks that have got water because by doing that that has killed off so many plays in, in the US you need a decent thick section so that you can both stimulate uh, the rock uh, significantly but not fracture into any surrounding rock uh, with associated water. This has nothing to do with pollution, this is nothing to do with getting chemicals into drinking water, this is purely to stop water infiltrating, uh, very close water infiltrating your, your, your well water. Um, and so we were looking uh, for thicknesses greater than, uh, than 50 meters being, being our minimum uh, amount of the sea. And so what do the wells basically say? Well, it is fascinating when you go through lots and lots of well reports in the North Sea. Uh, the commentary is, is nearly amusing at times, but when you go through the Cambridge Bay uh, section, which was typically a focus uh, for former sands or heller formation or, or for various conventional targets, and you find uh, wording like, you know, we didn't find our primary target, but you know, there was a, a reasonable sand in the Cambridge Bay and it produced lots of oil. Um, but it was useless because it wasn't our target and therefore we'll just shut in the well and then go away. Um, and virtually every well within a, uh, within a, a specific area will have nice light oil, lots of gas, and geochemical results that are off the scale. Um, and you had in many cases uh, both oil coming out of pores, oil coming to the surface, oil flowing through DSTs, and everybody overlooked it and went after something else. Um, and, sorry, you won't be able to read it. These are copies from logs, but um, this number here is a DST from the Cambridge Bay, from a very thin, sort of sandy, um, sandy uh, uh, sort of carbonate section. That flowed at 6,364 barrels a day. So an IP in, in U.S. terminology of 6,364. If we had that in any of our Permian wells in Texas, we'd be jumping for joy. And this was a totally, oh, it only produced 6,364 barrels a day from something that's not meant to be producing anything because it's meant to be a source rock. It, it's sort of laughable, but it, it's very interesting that in the right conditions, the Cambridge clay, it looks like an amazing source rock. Um, especially if you've got this mishmash of extremely high quality um, source rock plus lots of intervals that are either carbonate rich or have got sand springers in them as well. So what does the core look like in the Cambridge Bay? So here's our best guesstimate um, of what we think it looks like. Um, and bizarrely, pretty much 90% of all the oil and gas fields in the whole of the North Sea lie directly above where the Kimmeridge clay is in perfect core unconventional conditions. Um, you see this time and time again. If you go to Illinois, you get exactly the same. If you go to Texas and have the Midland Basin, the Delaware Basin of the Caribbean, you see exactly this. Um, so we, we believe that there is the potential to work because at certain flow rates, um, especially if you can target this using the existing infrastructure, um, and under certain fiscal regimes, um, the Cambridge Clay could stand a chance um, in the North Sea if you stick to what we believe are the key criteria, and that is uh, you're, you're dealing with a jack-up rig or a platform rig. Um, I don't think the economics work uh, using a semi so unless you've got amazing tax credits uh, already. Uh, you want to have the Cambridge Clay thicker than, than 50 meters. We believe it has to be in the 3,000 to 4,500 window um, to keep it economic. Um, having close proximity to infrastructure such as pipelines is, is very important for hooking costs. Uh, and also, we want to see evidence uh, from nearby wells that the Cambridge Clay application has flowed uh, oil and gas. So, lastly, Cambridge Clay, we believe, is a world class source rock. We all know that from a conventional point of view, we actually think that it could work unconventionally. Um, it's been massively overlooked as, as an informational play. Why? Because it's underwater. Like if we were way back in the last ice age where we could walk across the, the, the North Sea um, and we, did, we were fighting uh, with the fish to get their mineral rights, 
Um, I think that this would be one of the most amazing oil plays, type of oil plays, unconventional plays in the world. It is obviously underwater uh, today, and therefore, as people have been uh, looking around the world to find the best onshore plays, I think it could be overlooking one of the best plays, be it onshore or offshore, um, in the world. Just from some statistics that you could be looking at, if you got the cost base right, 50 billion barrels of recoverable reserves from the Greenwich Bay formation in the North Sea, where it has, uh, where it is in the mature setting. Um, so it's not onshore, it's offshore, but we believe that if you jack up rigs, uh, you will be able to test it, um, and also by re-entering wells or going from an existing platform, we also think it's got the potential as well. And given where we are with North Sea volumes, given where we are with uh, the infrastructure and, and jobs in the UK, um, we think that it should be given a chance and, and should be looked at. Thank you very much. Typically, you start to see at around about, nine, about eight to 9,000 feet, you get into these optimum <coughs> conditions as we see them um, for uh, expulsion for a lot of source rocks that look like this, just being very broad about it. Whereas it's you know, 11 to 14,000 feet here um, where you get into the, exactly the same conditions. And in some places, if you look at sulfur content, Parts of the Kimmers Clay you would class as a type 2S. Not all of it, but parts of it as well. So I, I think there's a, the Kimmers Clay seems to be a mishmash of what else was coming in to the basin at the time it was getting deposited. Now, whether you're, I don't think you're bringing in type 3 cubic stuff, um, because that's not that apparent, but I think there's probably a bit of type 1 coming in from somewhere uh, into it in, in various places. So yes, it, it, it varies. Yeah, then we, uh, I guess you've already started, but even the old literature, you know, with Brian Cooper, deceased from America, and Pat Barma, who were publishing, uh, showing different facies, organic facies of Kimmeridge, sometimes longer chains, but sometimes short. So that's it's super that that will be no doubt built into these moments. I, I, I think it has to be, um, and 
you know, it, it's, it, it just needs to, you know, we need to get to the next stage of, of starting to improve the concept of going well. Uh, Francis Morris Jones, I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about the commercial aspects. I know you've thought of this thing about the drilling and the jack ups. Are you assuming for active stimulation you need to take offshore um, the amount of horsepower and materials that would normally be associated with unconventional drilling? I, yeah, so, so it, basically where, where fracking is in the North Sea at the minute, it's mainly a Danish thing. Um, and they've been, uh, Maersk and others have been using it quite a lot um, over the last few years. Um, there are a few barges um, around that can do frack jobs. Um, so the technology is there in the North Sea. Um, I think it, ideally we need more government support to make this work at the end of the day. You know, it is expensive. You're talking flow rates that are um, fantastic for an unconventional setting, but way below what you would see in a conventional uh, setting. Um, uh, but we believe the economics do work if you're able to get these flow rates. And if you look at areas that are in the right depth, where you have got high um, amounts of gas and, and, and oil, we do think you can get these sort of IPs. So uh, it, it does just about make sense um, uh, commercially under current conditions. Um, now, you obviously don't want to move too many parameters such as oil prices and, and jack up rates and things like that around too much, um, and nor do you want big pipelines and things like that closing, uh, because obviously you, know, you, you, need, you need to keep the flip open and there's plenty of orange still available. So I think we've got a limited period of time where this is either going to work or it's not going to work or it's going to be um, basically something that keeps uh, individual platforms alive for a few more years because somebody's gone out and done from the platform. Nick? Yeah, uh, just quite yeah. <coughs> yeah, a couple of uh, comments. Um, if my colleague Andy Carl was here, he would be up in his feet right now and say we need to consider the role of pressure in the maturation because he believes that all we do with pressure is pushed way back down where it would be under normal pressures. The other comment I'd like to make is that uh, Geomark some years ago, we looked at all these oils and found a, high, a wide range of Kimberley oils and a great variety of families and subfamilies. We also found quite a major contribution from the Oxfordians as well. It's just a comment, not, not a question. Yeah, and you know, I have to go west of Shetland as well. Like you, you've got Middle Jurassic and Lower Jurassic influences too. Um, you know, I think all, all of that, I think there's, there is something important going on with the, the geochemistry and the depth. Um, although it's not to say that you haven't seen various other type 2 source rocks buried down to 11,000 feet and uplifted again to, to 8 or 9,000. I, I think you've just seen something slightly different here. Uh, but, you know, all of, I think you can throw rocks at this all day long based on all the problems associated with it. Um, I would hate to see the North Sea dying off without somebody giving this a go. Just a quick question. You mentioned about the distribution of mineralogy and also of uh, TOC. Has anybody looked at the distribution of biogenic silica and uh, come back to the talk earlier of the not to the expansion? It's not that uh, we're aware that this, this, uh, certainly you can see um, specific zones within the Cambridge clay, we haven't gone to that level. We basically have done this as a, an interesting research piece based on our name. We actually took it one stage further and bid in the 28th licensing round uh, for areas of the North Sea. Um, again, we, we don't know if we've been successful or not in, in that process. Um, but we thought we would give this, uh, certainly, as much as we could do in the time available um, looking at all the data that was available uh, before putting in a, a, a license application. And given the outcome of the 28th round, we'll, we'll wait to see how much further work we do on this. Uh, just a follow-up as well. One of the uh, slides earlier on showed a good relationship between the gamma and the TOC. 
but there was one particular zone where the, uh, the gamma was particularly high and the TMC was uh, very, very low. I think some care needs to be taken with screening wells for uh, using the gamma just for as, as a TOC proxy. Do you have a comment about that, Eliza? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you need to be very careful with holding wells just in terms of sampling. You know, if you go with the standard uh, periodic sampling techniques, it, you know, you, you can get things that we know, uh, like a good example is in the Permian. If you sample the Permian badly, like the things what, produce 50 billion barrels of oil, um, if you sample it badly, you can actually get really low TOCs in an area that is actually generating an awful lot of oil because you're, you're basically, you're not picking out from core exactly where the sample, you're just doing it randomly or in a set sequence from a well. So I, I would totally agree with you uh, from that point of view. We typically, the first thing we do is take a significant amount of core. If you go to the Illinois Basin, we've taken more core in the last two years in the Illinois Basin than has been taken in the entire basin by everybody in the last 30 years. And that's the only way we properly do it, to go back in and sample exactly where uh, we can see it's a black shale, we can see that there, there's oil, and that's the only proper way of doing it. Just, um so all that's in core on that particular image? I, you've got a mixture of, some of them have been core, some of them have not been core, and we, we do not read on the core. This is whatever the core report was. Another question over there? Peter Doe with Icon Science. Um, first, I empathize with your desire to see this tested, um, in particular because 25 years ago, I did a similar exercise on the coals in the North Sea to see what kind of gas we might be able to produce before the infrastructure goes. Which leads me on to the question, um, do you have a dialogue with DEC over the fact that this should be considered before decommissioning approval is given? As I mentioned, we, we have applied for acreage in the 28th project. Yeah, but that's something different. Um, that's, a, that's a new application. I'm talking about existing licenses and infrastructure. Uh, which we do not have in the North Sea, so that's why we have to go through a new application of the product. So that, I, I think I would rather comment uh, whenever we see the outcome of the, the 28th licensing round. There, I think the government is well aware, if you look at any of the documents from the, the Scottish referendum uh, that have been produced, there has been quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of renewed interest in the Kimbridge clay. There, there are other companies, for example, who've got active presentations um, out there looking at the site back in Graven and in semi sub territory and so on. So I think you're, the government are well aware that the industry has started to um, be interested in Kimbridge clay. Okay, okay. anybody else? Yeah, please. Um, this looks to be very much like um, like cross pay. That's been a big deal between North America for like 30 years. Do you see this could be just a kind of a renaissance in this part of the world, the same way it happened over there? Or is this a totally different way of Um I, I think you've got, you, well, sort of the Mississippi line is, is a good example of bypass play. Or I, I start to call a lot of these things saturated systems. Um, in terms of our screening process, we go through lots and lots and lots of old well logs and anything with a 10% or less porosity people walk away from. Now it could be chock and block of oil with you know 15% water saturation or, or lower, so effectively buying water and people walk away from it because the porosity is below whatever the, the company's cutoff was for porosity at that time. Um, so that's part of our business. That's why we are in Germany. That's why we are in the Mississippi line, in the Illinois Basin, and then Colorado. Um, I, I think, again, it's going to come down to, it's not so much is the resource there, is the opportunity there. I believe that that's pretty easy to, to determine, um, actually relatively little geological work. 